Good morning. Welcome to uh, another service at the Northwest Church. We're uh, thankful that you've joined us and we ask that uh, you participate with us in every way that you can this morning. Josh will be bringing us a lesson. And uh, this morning, I'm the welcome and the elder guy, so um, I'm double duty. So welcome to our services. I want to, I've been thinking about how do we bring some positive thoughts into this crazy world we're living in right now. And the book that came to my mind was Philippians. That's a power-packed four chapters, three pages letter that really fits where we're living right now. So I just wanted to, to talk about Paul for a second. Paul wrote this letter while he was in prison. I mean, he was, uh, he was seriously quarantined and he was, um, Socially dis well, he wasn't socially distanced to the other inmates, but he was in serious quarantine when he wrote this. I want to, ch I just want to read what he thought about all of this. Um, all of these scriptures I'm going to read are from Philippians. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains. Most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. In this letter, Paul uh, does, he gives a lot of encouragement. It's definitely worth a read. I recommend that you do that. I'm going to look at two more verses. I'm not going to say anything about them because I don't know how to improve on them. So I'm going to read those and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Jesus Christ. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, Put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Thank you, and uh, enjoy the service to come.
Good morning, everybody. As you can tell, I got rid of the seat. I've had my Dr. Pepper this morning. I'm feeling feeling great. I'm able to stand up, move around a bit. I can go to the left. I can go over here to the right. Uh, man, it's just good to be able to stand up again and preach. I know that sounds silly, but it's just something that I normally do, and I haven't been able to do that in some time. So I walked in here this morning. I told Kevin, I was like, all right, the chair has got to go. I got to get out of that thing. This week has been interesting because today is my Tuesday. Today's probably your Sunday, but today's my Tuesday. And I've, and I've put a, a, a lesson together, uh, maybe a little different than I normally have before. I felt a little rushed in all honesty, but um, I wanted to throw that. I wanted to not throw this together, but I wanted to put this together for you today and just know that we can amaze God. It's this concept of Jesus being amazed in the scripture. And I guess I've never, when I looked at it, I've read it before, but I just didn't quite understand, wait a minute, there are things that we can do in this life that amaze Jesus Christ. Let me ask you this though. Have you ever asked somebody something without really asking? And most of the time they'd say, well, stop beating around the bush. Just ask me what you want. Well, you're going to find that there was a story in the Bible that this man didn't ask God for something per se, but of course the request was known that that's what he was looking for. A Roman soldier, part of the army that was occupying Israel at the time, asked if Jesus could come heal his servant. Well, okay, so he didn't really ask. He made a statement. But how Jesus responded, how he responded to one of the most classic passages in all of Scripture. So before we jump there, you can go ahead and turn there if you want, Matthew chapter 8. But before we go there, while, and while you're turning, I want to give you a little background here. So Jesus had just delivered his Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, all the way into chapter 7. Then right before this particular text, he healed the leper in Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. Now he's approached by a Roman centurion, by the way, of about a leader of about, say, a hundred some odd men, who asked Jesus for help. Oh, wait, he didn't really ask him for help, and you're going to see that, but he did make a statement. And what would Jesus do? What would he say in this particular situation? So let's look at the text. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 10. I'll be reading in verse 5. And when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, imploring him, and saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. Jesus said to him, I will come and I will heal him. But the, but the centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will he'll be healed. For I also am a man under authority, with soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in all of Israel. Now there's our text. But before I just jump right in and dive into the text, I want us to gain some knowledge about this particular text and more about some of the history. Now you're going to find, when I come to my point one, two, three, and 4, you're going to find that I am not going to redirect you personally and have that hit home for you in your life on every single point. I'm going to wait. I'm going to let you do that as you go, and then I'm going to help out at the very end by bringing it all back home to us. So let's gain a little bit of knowledge this morning. Centurions, they were commanders of about a hundred Roman soldiers. And these men, of course, had various jobs and they were placed in various parts of the entire Roman Empire. Their main job, their main duty, they had other duties, but their main duty was to keep the peace. Of course, this job held some great responsibility, even the responsibility of the execution of people just like the crimes that Jesus Christ was accused of. This particular centurion, though, he had a problem, and it was a big problem. You see, his servant was suffering some, from a major and serious disease. One thing I didn't really know, but I looked at some other translations and went back to the original language. The King James Version uses this sick of the palsy. New American says paralyzed at home. The point is, there was little, if any, hope that this servant would get better at all. 
So here we are this morning, right here in the text, and I want to do something a little different than I usually do. I've been moved this week to do a text study, right? Looking at verse by verse. I want us to look at verses 5 and 6. And when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, imploring him, and said, Lord, my servant. Now, what is he imploring him to do? Well, he's giving him a statement. And he says, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. Number one, here we go. The centurion made an appeal. Now, what I want you to start off by start off by figuring out here in the story is the centurion made, he made first a very respectful greeting to Jesus. And I want you to think about this. Think about the root of the situation in the time, who who we're dealing with here. The centurion, he had authority. He had authority to demand to see Jesus, right? This part of the story could have been completely and drastically different. He could have said something like, hey, you teacher, heal my servant. And I mean, do it right now. He could have employed threats without any fear of recourse whatsoever. But he didn't. He didn't do anything like that. He approached Jesus with the most love and with the most respect. He gave him a great deal of dignity all through the process. Notice that he called Jesus Lord. Probably one of the best terms for us in today. There's so many different meanings and you'd have to look at every single one. What does this represent? But one of the best ways, and multiple scholars I looked up said this, one of the best ways to translate this word for in our language today would be the word sir, actually, which is more remarkable. The centurion didn't have to give any kind of respectful greeting to anyone, well, except for his own superiors. And all the more remarkable, Jesus was a Jew. And the Romans had zero obligation to pay any time, any kind of respect to their subjects. But he did. And did you notice that the centurion here, he made no direct appeal for healing. He didn't say anything like, oh, would you please come to my house and heal my servant? I've seen the miracles that you're doing. You're able to lay hands on him and I know that you can heal him. He didn't say any of that. He simply reported the servant's condition. He says, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. That was his statement. The centurion had some kind of faith. He must have heard enough. He must have seen enough to believe enough to ask Jesus about his servant. And Jesus replied, I'll come and heal him. We must all remember each one of us, that we need to make these appeals to God based on what we already know about Him. We already know that He's the great healer. We already know that He's the great comforter. We already know that He's the great controller. Right here in this lesson, I stopped. And I'm going, yeah, Josh, but that is so easy to say, but so difficult to do. Because yes, we can lean on God, but doesn't our faith diminish at times when we're under this burden? And then I go, well, not if we have confidence. And, I, and I'm talking this out, and I'll, I'll never forget my room. I, you know, I'm going back and forth with it. I'm trying to battle my own self with this scripture. And this came to my mind, this word confidence. We must have confidence towards him, just like the centurion. Listen to this, that if we ask anything, anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 through 15. Here's one more. Before they call, I will answer. And listen to this. This is such a powerful verbiage here. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 24. This is one text that I'm going to come back to at the very end, but I'm going to read it one more time for you. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. It kind of leads me right into point number two. If we look at verse seven, Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Now remember, point number one, the centurion made an appeal and no, I'm not going to redirect these and make it home for you. You have to, you have to do this on your own. Work with me. 
Number one, the centurion made an appeal. Number two, Jesus gave him an answer. He says, I will come and heal him. Now think about this. It's only six words, but they were some of the most profound things ever spoken. I will come and I will heal him. Well, why was this so remarkable? Well, for one thing, the Jews were basically, well, they were forbidden to enter the house of anyone who was not Jewish. And if you think about this a little bit down the road, Simon Peter ran into this very same problem some years later after he went to the house of Cornelius. And let's not forget that Cornelius was a Roman centurion also, maybe following by example. You can find that story in Acts chapter 10. So we can see that Jesus was willing to break some Jewish traditions here, if not even commands, to perform a simple act of mercy. Not because he was asked to do so, but because he knew the heart of man and that's what he had the desire to do was to have his servant healed. This willingness to go to the centurion's home shows us just how much that Jesus loves all people. It's no secret that the Jews hated the Romans. It's no secret at all. But Jesus was trying to put a stop to this by the kind of the mercy that he had and all of the miraculous healings that were going on. You see one just four verses earlier. You know, I've talked to so many different people that just do not believe that they're worthy to pray. For that matter, no matter what, they just say, I have done so much, I'm not even worthy to be forgiven. I don't believe that because I've done all these things that God can forgive me. Jesus was, everywhere he went, was all about breaking down barriers, right? Everywhere he walked on earth, every town he went to, it was about breaking down barriers. And the way that he did that was he showed mercy. The kind acts of mercy to people. Guys, we have example after example after example for his love for all people. Never refusing. Jesus never refused to touch the untouchable. That others would cast out of the city. Think about this. Get out of the city. Not out of my house. Not out of my neighborhood. Not out of my community. Outside the gate that I don't even have to look at you, smell you, touch you, or see you. And yet, Jesus would exit the city and go to them. Acts of mercy. An example showing that I love all people. Not allowing the least to be insulted. (laughs) Think about the people who were in sin, falls at the feet of Jesus. He protects them because they admit to their sin while other people were in the background holding the stones and saying, I'm ready to attack. He's saying, don't attack. We must remember this concept when people walk through our doors at the building or in our home. Or wherever we may be, when we see someone that looks different from us, that's wearing different clothes than us, that's on a different wealth level than us. Remember, the centurion made an appeal. Jesus gave him an answer. And here's your number three, the centurion's reply. Verses eight and nine. But the, but the centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And then you hear the centurion's words. Ah, Jesus' response. Can you imagine the reaction from the centurion when he heard these words? I will come and I will heal him. Now remember, he had only made a polite request. And he said, my servant is sick. And Jesus comes along. He at least, at least breaks two social taboos. One, giving respect to a Gentile, and two, going into his house. Look at what he tells Jesus in his reply. In so many words, this is Lopez translation, he comes along and he says, you don't have to do all that, (laughs) right? You don't have to do all that. I'm not worthy for you to visit me in my home. Just say the word, the servant be healed. Do that. Don't don't go out of your way. Don't do all that. Don't, Don't get in trouble, right? 
And then you know the story here in the Bible where he gives his authority and he shares uh, his, his authority over his subordinates. But what's interesting is that his words had a huge effect on Jesus. And this is where it kind of struck me. So Jesus had been talked to in many different ways, some good, some bad. And even in the good moments, we don't get Jesus' response like he did to the centurion. Jesus is amazed by those with great faith. It bridges me right into point number four. Here we go, number four. Jesus was amazed. Look at verse 10. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, Truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. It is one of the few times in Scripture where Jesus was amazed or where he marveled at something. This past Sunday, I woke up and I woke up to hands on my face. (laughs) Both of my little girls had jumped up in bed and woke me up, hands on my face, and they go, Daddy, Daddy, wake up. And I, I opened up to both of my little girls kissing me on the cheek. The first words that I heard on that day was, Happy Father's Day. They took me by the hand. They had a camera. Jamie gave me a a camera. I was supposed to be recording. And they had me walk all the way into another room with my eyes closed. And I'm holding the camera. And they kept saying, keep coming, Daddy. Go left a little. Go right a little. They took me all the way to to the couch. And I sat down. And they play, and I'm not, I'm not even going to tell you the song because if I start saying the words of the song, I'm going to boohoo. So they played this song for me and both of them sang to me. They said that daddy, you're enough, that you do everything for us. Now I sat there, I cried. And I gave them a big hug. And yes, they got it all on video. Jamie, don't you dare. (laughs) But they have it all on video. And I embraced them. And I told them that I love them. And I told them, thank you so much. It's the best Father's Day I've ever had. And I think about that. The next morning, it was Monday morning, I woke up. And I didn't have a kiss on my cheek. And I, I wasn't led to the couch for them to sing to me. But do you know what they did for me? They gave me recognition of my faith to my God. That the first words that would come out of my mouth was, Father, it it is your day. It's Father's Day. It's the Lord's Day. And they gave me that. And I think that the response that Jesus had with this centurion that the recognition of faith that was seen there, that Jesus could heal the centurion servant, that he could do it from a distance, an unknown distance, by the way, who knows how far that was, coming from a man of authority, even a Gentile, to say the least, Jesus was amazed. He marveled at such a man. And one thing that we sometimes forget is Christ's absolute humanity. His ability to love, his ability to show anger, his experience with being hungry and thirsty, to be amazed and marvel at certain things. I pray that these four points, and I told you earlier, I was not going to give you a point by point and bring it home for you every single time. I I pray that you've been able to do that on your own today. But I told you I'd help you in the end. And in closing, I want to share this with you. Make your appeals to God. Right? Last week we learned about that God was searching for men. And this week we learned that he hears our words before we ever even spake them. And Isaiah. Make your appeals to God. God will answer. So be ready to be shocked. He constantly stays ahead of us, right? He sees the road traveled before we ever even get on the road. God will answer, so be ready to be shocked. 
And then we must reply. We must reply in humility and in faith. The centurion replied, Lord, sir, I'm not worthy. And then desire to amaze God with your faith. Listen, it's not wrong for you, want, for you wanting God to be proud of you. God seeks faithful servants. I just pray this morning. I pray that I did the centurion and his story justice this morning. Learn from these stories. Hold all these stories that you learn every single week. Hold them close. And don't just hold them close and have the knowledge about them, but implement that teaching into your life. Every single day, we wake up. It's a Father's Day to our Lord. God bless all of you. Have a great week. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand, in Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on Him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground His body lay. Light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands for victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Good morning, family. I just want to start off today by thanking everyone for all the encouragement and the kind words that you've offered in regards to these online worship videos. And I just pray that they've been beneficial uh, for you and helping keep you strong. I just want to say it's an honor to be able to lead us in the communion meditation today. And I pray that it will help you really orient your mind and focus on Jesus today. I'd like to begin by reading out of Luke chapter 22, and I'm going to begin in verse 14. We read that when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, 
Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And so I think it's important that we always remember why we take part in this communion and why we have these symbols of the bread and the cup that represent Jesus' body and the blood that he shed for us on the cross. One extra component, though, that I think it's important that we remember is this idea of the new covenant. And again, we read in verse 20 that Jesus says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And so while it's important that we always remember the sacrifice, we always remember the pain um, and just the love that he had for us to be willing to go through all of that, I want to orient us in our minds today on this new covenant. One of the best verses that I feel like to really explain what does Jesus mean when he says a new covenant is actually found in Hebrews chapter 9, which I'd like to read for you now. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 15. We read that, For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, and that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. I'm going to skip down to verse 23. It says, It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one, But he entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. I really love that verse because it puts in perspective just what Christ accomplished for us when he was killed on the cross and when he was resurrected again to life. He secured salvation for all mankind that would accept it for all of time. And right now he is in heaven and he is interceding for us. And we know that we can go to him. We can go to God uh, through him and offer our prayers of repentance and ask for that forgiveness and that we will receive it each and every time we ask because of what Jesus had done. And that's the covenant. That's the promise that he made to us and that we've entered into and that we remember every single time we partake of the bread and we partake of the cup, not just the symbols of his body and blood, but the future that's secured in the salvation that we have uh, through Jesus. So I just want to uh, bring those things to our the forefront of our minds today, and um, I pray that you can meditate on them as, as we pray and give thanks for the body and the, the bread and the, the cup. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this day and just thankful for the time that we have to really be able to sit down and remember Jesus, Father. I'm, I'm so thankful that you gave us this this tool, this way to constantly be reminding ourselves. I know for me personally, Father, I need the reminders. And I'm just thankful that each and every week we get to take a breath and really just clear our minds and think about what your son not only suffered and what he was willing to do for us, but what he accomplished for us and the salvation that he brings us and that um, is guaranteed as long as we remain in him. Please help us to stay strong, Father. Please help this remembrance be something that can give us strength in this upcoming week. I just thankful, I'm just i just thankful for your son. I'm thankful for Northwest and this body and, and all the believers around the world, Father. Just please be with us today as we uh, give praise to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.